All right, everyone, welcome back. It's another episode of Masari's Unqualified Opinions. I'm Ryan Selkis at Two Bit Idiots. Another fantastic guest today. Excited to have Alex Leishman, who's the co founder and CEO of River Financial, a Bitcoin focused uh, institutional prime brokerage and, and multi services company. Um, we're going to touch on all things Bitcoin, uh, River's somewhat unique strategy. Most exchanges, most financial companies are, are going broad with asset coverage. River is very intentionally going broad with the type of services it's providing around uh, Bitcoin uh, as an asset in particular. Um, Alex, before we get into what River is and, and the direction that you're going, some of the, the recent developments of the company, why don't we just start off with a bit of your background, how you got into the industry. I know it's, you know, everybody has a rabbit hole story. It's as good a place to start as any to give people proper context and, and help uh, inform why you're doing what you're doing today. Totally. Yeah. So uh, I got started. Uh, so I think it makes sense for me to go back to when I was an undergrad in college. I was studying aerospace engineering, but reading a lot about um, economics, started reading Thomas Sowell, Milton Friedman. Uh, eventually, by the end of my college, uh, my undergraduate years, I uh, read Friedrich Hayek's The Nationalization of Money. And after that, had become obsessed with this idea of competing currencies and non-government money. And I formulated you know, a, a big goal in, in life at that point to help create a financial institution that offer people access to money that was outside the control of the Federal Reserve. And I didn't know about Bitcoin at this point. Uh, it was just an interest of mine to you know, someday do something like this. I didn't know how, how it would work or how I'd be able to achieve something like that. Um, there were various ideas that had been floated around over the years, going back to commodity-backed money that was privately issued, all the way to you know, including things like Liberty Dollar, um, but, you know, you see how those, those things ended for the people who started them and was not very, you know, eager to have the same fate. So I, you know, just chewed on it for a while. Uh, and then eventually it was uh, kind of deep, diving deep into web, web programming, web engineering, and came across this Bitcoin thing uh, on an online, online class I was taking, actually. And when I realized what it was, I... Um, you know, I, I like this. I had that light bulb moment. It felt like the prophecy had been fulfilled. <laughs> and ever since then, um, I, I I went down the rabbit hole, and then I've never left. That was you know back in 2013, and um, the rest is history. I've been so after that, I moved to San Francisco. I'm originally from Maryland, mm -hmm. um, and uh, moved to San Francisco. Went down the software engineering route. Uh, started as an entry level software engineer out here at a at a, one of the early Bitcoin brokerages that was focused on the market in Taiwan. I then ended up going back to grad school. Went to Stanford to do my master's degree in computer science, focused on computer security. Helped teach the first Bitcoin class there with Dan Benet as the professor. I was one of the teaching assistants. Helped create a lot of the coursework for that um, now CS two hundred and fifty one uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And back then it was it wasn't as sexy as AI, but I think these days a lot of that class is pretty popular. And then, um, you know, been out, been out in the Valley, basically, you know, the vast majority of my career, uh, have mostly spent my time out here working on Bitcoin stuff. Uh, had a, had a short stint at Airbnb on the security team as well, just to get that for a big tech experience, see what a big organization, an engineering organization looks like. And, um, that was you know, pretty valuable. Glad I did that, but I, you know, I didn't last long. I, I just missed Bitcoin too much. Um, you know, booking, booking people's houses just wasn't as fun to me as uh, global internet money. So, uh, so uh, yeah, and then started River with my, with my co-founder, Andrew Benson, um, who's also my cousin. We started that about a year ago and been working on that ever since. The company used to be called Alto Financial, and then um, we changed our name and domain uh, to river.com and River Financial uh, last fall. And uh, talk a little bit more about um, the strategy with the rollout. Uh, I think given the polarization within the industry, you could imagine there would be a, a healthy uptick in interest just from the religious minded folks and Bitcoin maximalists uh, looking to promote 
a service like River that's going to be explicitly focused on Bitcoin as an asset, on soup to nuts services surrounding Bitcoin as, as a payment technology and, and settlement layer. Um, I assume that was very intentional, um, but let's talk about the breadth of services and then what, if anything, would uh, cause River to ultimately extend beyond just Bitcoin? Sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, so, so I, I do want to say that being Bitcoin only, I mean, is, you know, obviously the main reason here is because one, that is the one cryptocurrency that I do think has the best chance of becoming global money and becoming um, a worldwide agreed upon store of value. And the others just don't really, you know, carry that, um, have, you know, have the traction, the network effect, and the, and the technology that the Bitcoin network has. However, there's also a very practical aspect to all this as well. So um, I think at first, maybe to help describe what we do today and kind of the vision River will take, and then, to, and then that, that will kind of illustrate why focusing on only Bitcoin is actually, it's, it's more than just religious, it's just economically advantageous for us as a company. Mm -hmm. So, um, so t today, uh, our product is, is mostly consumer focused, but we're, we're, we're quickly expanding into the institutional space. So uh, today, uh, it's very easy for an individual to um, sign up for an account. The onboarding flow is extremely easy. We try to, we've, we've tried to simplify it as much as possible, even though we do have to do KYC stuff. Um, they can connect their bank account and easily buy Bitcoin right away. There's no order books. There's no candlestick charts or anything like that. It's an experience for somebody who's not a trader. Uh, it, it's the, our target market is, um, you know, people who want a Bitcoin only service and the simplicity that simplicity that comes with that and access to, to the Bitcoin um, tooling like, you know, um, native SegWit and the lightning network and things like that. We offer all of that, but we also are targeting um, individuals who, are in the mass affluent to high net worth to ultra high net worth folks who don't know a lot about Bitcoin, but have an expectation for the type of tools that any financial service they use provides. Mm -hmm. And we want to make Bitcoin as simple for them as possible, but also provide them the tooling and the experience that they would expect from the traditional financial institutions they're used to. Specifically, um, one thing we have on our platform that that I don't think I've seen anywhere else actually is the ability to see your performance of your account and easily see your unrealized gains and losses. Um, all of the other services in the United States, at least uh, from what, from what I've seen require you to download Excel files or CSVs and calculate all these things yourself, which is kind of silly. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a complete, complete disaster. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, um, the way the way I like to explain this is our team is very Bitcoin native. We are very much, you know, I, I run the San Francisco Bitcoin Developer Meetup. I've been heads down on this technology for a very long time, as, and so has most of the engineering team. But we're also very financial tooling native. Um, we recently had someone join us from UBS who is running a wealth management um, practice there. We've had an accountant, our, our a CPA who's our director of finance um, on the teams from a very early stage. And using those that professional uh, those professional insights as well to build out this product, and um, on top of that, we have phone support. So we have a phone number that anyone can call. Um, we've seen great response from this so far. Uh, you know, just anecdotally, you know, fifty people who are fifty and up have signed up, found it very easy to use, uh, and have complimented us on how easy we've made it for them to buy Bitcoin, and and that's what we've been going for. Um, and. Part of that is partially because we're Bitcoin only. Uh, you know, the, the feedback we've gotten from a lot of these folks is when they, or, or, or younger people who send their parents to some of these sites is they go there, they see Bitcoin Cash, Ripple, you know, all this stuff. And they're like, what the heck is this? They have no idea what's going on. All they've heard about is Bitcoin. And um, it just really throws them off. This is a, uh, simplicity is, is, is key, I think, for um attracting this demographic and so far we have you know good results showing that that's working um, but then you know for the company going forward there are two main categories um, there's the consumer side and there's the institutional side and um, by focusing on Bitcoin only what we're able to do is go broad across a suite of 
various financial services around Bitcoin instead of going broad, uh, focusing on one sort of financial service, going broad across multiple assets. Um, there's only so much you can do um, with a technical team. And um, instead of going broad across assets, we're focusing on the one asset that pretty much everyone wants and sees as digital money. Even people who buy you know, altcoins and stuff still want Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Providing a suite of financial services around that. So specifically on the consumer side of things, um, things as simple as a joint account, right? Um, yeah, you still can't sign up and front any of these services and have a joint account with your wife, right? Um, and have the legal documents all there, transfer of death and, and all that stuff sorted out. And for anyone with the real amount of money, these things are just par for the course for any proper mm-hmm. financial institution. Um, focusing on the family, right? Um, most individual wealth in the United States, it's not held by a single person, it's held by some sort of family structure, right? Whether that's a joint account, whether, you know, um, you know, people are married and have kids and that wealth, the tools to manage that wealth, um, you know, needs to be more than just a single login, right? And uh, one person's name on that account. So things like um, uh, named accounts, uh, you know, designated for your child uh, that to transfer them when they come of age, um, set up in a tax advantage way, right? Um, so sort of tax advantage t- type of accounts, mm-hmm. um, multi-user access, and then on the institutional side, um, there's accounting tooling, uh, multi-user access with with very granular security and permission controls, um, and of course, underlying all of this is the ability for people to buy and sell and con- convert between the dollars and Bitcoin, but um, you know, our, our goal here is to focus on this kind of stuff instead of supporting a bunch of different assets. And then on the, tech, on the technology and the backend side of things, by focusing on only Bitcoin, we can build a, we can move a lot faster and we can build a lot more secure infrastructure because we don't need to abstract our systems across arbitrary types of private keys and signers and all that stuff. We can use native Bitcoin multi-sig for our cold storage. We can use Bitcoin's native hardened um, protocols and tooling for everything. And um, for example, like partially signed Bitcoin transactions is a standard that allows us to just have the standard way of passing Bitcoin transactions around to various parts of our system. They all know exactly what to do and how to sign these things. If we added even just one more type of you know, digital asset, that wouldn't work at all. And we'd have to re- rebuild our systems and abstract them without the help of these, these well-constructed standards. And um, it become you know ten times more complex. So there is really a practical uh, aspect to all of this. And um, mm-hmm. so far, we've been very happy with the choice to be Bitcoin only. So first, I mean, let's talk about the the consumer element because this is a non traditional approach to go after two very different target markets. But I think it's one that's not necessarily foreign in crypto. And I speak from experience because when we think about Masari's customer user base long term, we're kind of riding the wave of the rest of the market. They're, by definition, the power users, the hardcore hobbyists, and, and some individual professionals might be early users of our tools, but the expectation is that ultimately the industry graduates to higher and higher levels and this becomes an institutional asset class. For you and the support of Bitcoin, I'd imagine that's especially true. Having said that, from a consumer standpoint, who is the target consumer? Because if I take a 30,000 foot view, something like Coinbase, something like Binance, you know, a whole slew of other uh, consumer focused options, maybe Square at some point, Robinhood, um, they all exist, they work pretty well and, and, and they are very targeted uh, in terms of mobile app support, in terms of brand awareness and, and existing staying power. As you think about that split, are consumers just a byproduct of what you're already marketing to institutional customers, or is there a real concerted effort, and have you seen some momentum early on with the consumer market in, in particular? So, so this company is, was started with the consumer market in mind, um, specifically the Bitcoin power users and high net worth people. That's our target consumer market, and that's what the product was built around and, and focused around and, and it is today and, and will be going forward. The institutional side of things um, is something that's more from inbound interest, and we've realized that there's also big potential there, and we're also working on building out those tools. So 
we're, we're so the, the core of our company right now and going forward will be our, our individual consumers and the institutional side of things is quickly growing. Mm -hmm. Uh, so in terms of, um, you know, the way we think about this is that we don't see, so we, we see people who are using Bitcoin today as people are investing today in tomorrow's money is what we like to say. So we're not building something that looks exactly like a brokerage, but we're also not building something that looks exactly like a bank. However, I would say we're, we're building something that looks more like a bank than a brokerage, right? The, the vision here is to bring Bitcoin to the world and to legitimize Bitcoin as money. And if people are going to use Bitcoin as money, people need Bitcoin banks. And we're building banking services, uh, you know, not officially, like we can't, I'm not, I'm not, you know, from the legal context, we're not legally a bank, right? But that's the inspiration behind the services we're building. And um, so, you know, like the, serv the services that I mentioned earlier, such as things on the consumer side, like joint accounts, um, proper accounting tools, um, statements, and all of the, all of the standard account types and tooling and serp and, and, and bank like services that people expect from their U S dollar banks. Uh, we want to provide that for people with Bitcoin. Same thing with institutions. I think, I think uh, I want to, I want to dive into this though, because it, it seems to me you're talking about two very different audiences, even within that group, you keep saying banking like services, Bitcoin is, is like money or could be like money. Um, on the other hand, you know, the, the business model that I think you do have or the target that you, that you do have right now in terms of an audience, probably think about this more as a prime brokerage account because every single transaction is going to be a taxable event. People are getting into Bitcoin for the first time because mm -hmm. they think about it like digital gold. They want to know what their cost basis is from a tax reporting standpoint as they think about things like tax loss harvesting or, or averaging in. All that Absolutely. makes sense. Um, so I, I get a little bit confused if we're conflating that with a Venmo like payment app experience, which I don't think is what you're going for, but, but you keep saying no. like services and, and, and Bitcoin is money. So how, how do you kind of reconcile the two things or, or, or are we just talking past each other? A bit? Well, I don't think we're on, on a different wavelength here. Um, so, you know, we're not building a Venmo sort of thing right now. But if you think about what a high net worth person has with a bank, um, mm -hmm. it's a phone number they can talk to. It is someone who often has a high level view of, of their assets um, and can help them move their money when they need it. And mm -hmm. just because Bitcoin is also used as an investment uh, and, and, that, and people want to know their cost basis and, their, and see their tax slots, and which, which we provide very clearly to everybody, we're even surfacing the ability to do specific identification when you sell and mm -hmm. transact and we keep track of all that information for you. Bit, it's confusing because Bitcoin is confusing. Bitcoin lives in this weird world between an investment and money. And we've never seen anything like that before. And therefore our product is going to live in this duality between this sort of brokerage type service and a bank like service. And um, that's part of what I would say is unique about Bitcoin and, and unique about our company. And it's going to look like a financial institution that no one's quite seen before. Mm -hmm. And um, it is, it does sound confusing, but the reality is the vast majority of people today, they just want to buy and hold Bitcoin. But there's also a solid number of people that want to transact in Bitcoin, especially institutions mm -hmm. um, who are, who are paying people in Bitcoin and using it as working capital individuals. We expect will can, well, as Bitcoin continues to grow, the, the reasons to use Bitcoin will move, more and more from an, an, a speculative, like long-term investment to a transactional currency, or at least um, something that they, they do use to move wealth around. And that's, you know, so, so that's the approach we're taking here. And that's how we're thinking about this, but whether or not it's a long-term investment or they're using it day-to-day -day in transactions, um, the same needs still apply. People need these um, people need, uh, joint accounts, they need multi-user access, they need accounting tooling, they need tax advantaged uh, services. And mm -hmm. um, especially the higher net worth people, they want someone, they want a higher touch service that can help them out with all these things. 
Look, I, I think it makes a ton of sense. Uh, I'll, uh, I don't very rarely uh, do anything like this, but I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a, a vouch and, and uh, marketing plug here. I, I think that most people that haven't been knee deep in, in the industry for a while don't understand what a fucking nightmare tax reporting is. You know, when I got into the industry in, in mid, late 2013, um, Coinbase was my first impression of the industry, as I'm sure it was many others. Mm -hmm. um, then Circle launched. Then I opened up exchange accounts. Then I transferred money to a ledger. I, I moved money to Zappo for, for you know, certain purposes. And one of the reasons I had all of these different services in place was, A, the fee structure was different, and B, you knew that enough services had failed where you kind of had to move money around just in case you were going to be a victim of some you know, hack or, or exploit. So it's just good portfolio management, just single asset portfolio management. And the long-term disaster that I think that is going to cause for me, for so many other people, and it took hour, hundreds of hours probably collectively just to reconcile cost bases for, for my own personal taxes. I think that alone is, is worth its weight in gold. And then if you can um, ultimately pair that with something that I think you also do well, this recurring buy option, if, if mm -hmm. you can basically turn that into something where every single transaction that you conduct, which is a payment, is first um, front run maybe by a recurring purchase. So, so if you can take a tax consequence out of that transaction and, and essentially bifurcate between a savings account and a checking account, one of which is, is just leveraging Bitcoin as a rail, um, mm -hmm. the other which is, is treated more like a, a, a prime brokerage account and, um, and something that actually treats this as in, in terms of your gains and losses. That to me seems like maybe uh, where this could evolve and, and, and where you're able to thread that needle. This is a consumer payment and, and investment you know, application or one, one umbrella. Um, I'm not trying to lead too much but maybe give a little bit of, of a skeptic's context, uh, knowing that this has been a personal pain point for me. Um, and and can I also ask, like, is, is that spot on? Are there shades of gray there? What, um, how are you thinking about that in general? Because pay, you know, payments, they're, they're kind of a nice to have, but they're not a must have for most of Bitcoin's demographic today that's thinking about this like digital gold. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's, that's spot on, Ryan. And to, to paint a picture of what the product is going to look like um, in, in the coming months, um, right now you just have one account when you log in, one user, one account. To, to paint a picture of what we're, what we're building out here is you'll be able to log in and uh, just and create multiple types of accounts, right? And so um, one of them being a sort of transactional account, um, similar to what you were saying, one of them being your account for you know, longer term proper um, investing and, uh, the, the, the cost basis challenges and, and the reporting challenges when an account is shared between used for investment and transactions, um, get really messy. And that's something that we have already started to solve for individuals. For example, um, right now, uh, you see all your cost basis, but do you really want to see a, a cost basis or a tax lot for every time someone sends you a 10 Satoshis on the lightning network? Um, no. Right. And, and so we've, we've been thinking through all of these sorts of problems and um, you know, the, the way the product is moving is for the consumer, you'll be able to log in, see a transactional account, see a, you know, deep savings vault, um, uh, you know, like lending tax advantaged accounts, right? Um, you do have a small business. You want to see that just kind of umbrella under your own, under your own login. Do you have a joint account with your wife? Um, she, she'll be able to, you'll see that you'll see her, um, name on that as well. And she'll potentially be able to have access to that. Uh, you want accounts for your kids. Uh, you'll see all those under your login as well. And, um, you know, that's the goal here, uh, is that kind of future. Mm -hmm. Um, the, so we'll talk about the second, uh, element here, which is the institutional side. I, I think it, it, it makes sense as a wedge to build for an end user and individual in mind. As far as institutions go, there's a new crop that's coming in that's going to expect these types of services as, as table stakes. At the same time, there are other pretty darn good options between Fidelity um, and Tagomi and, and some of the upgrades that, that other uh, very large crypto household names like Coinbase are, are, are making on the, um, 
on the institutional side. Mm-hmm. How, how can you compete or, or how can you get a, a foothold into that market if part of your brand and, and MO is that you're not going to be supporting other assets anytime soon? Um, that's not a sacrifice that, that many other institutional-focused companies are going to make. And, and I want to finish the thought here just with a historical example. Um, I have tremendous respect for, for Wences Cesaris uh, from Zappo. Mm-hmm. And he was adamant for forever, and, and I think still is, about supporting Bitcoin, Bitcoin only for mm-hmm. institutional capacity. That ended up hurting them significantly with crypto funds, other family offices, investors that needed multi-asset support for institutional custody. And I, I'm wondering how you can avoid getting pigeonholed there or, or feeling like you're going to ultimately be forced to support other assets, even if they're not core um, in, the, in the short to medium term for that clientele where you're going to have some whale customers that come to you and maybe they only want Bitcoin to start, but then there's another asset that crops up and they say, actually, we really like to take a look at this. We'd like to do it, you know, under one umbrella today, you know, face the, do you as a company face the risk that you might absolutely must support other assets sooner than you want to or, or risk losing some of that business? Where, where does that fit on your list of concerns? Yeah. And that's a great question. And we get asked that a lot. And I just, I think it's kind of, um, you know, to illustrate how we think about this, I, actually, uh, I don't think about not supporting other assets as a sacrifice at all. In, in fact, I think it's the opposite. I, I think having to support other other assets is the sacrifice. And I think that what we, what I think that the the um, the family of companies that that you mentioned. First of all, there's there's two main things here. One, where our institutional product is not focused on traders or or institutions that are fine financial institutions that are looking mm-hmm. for, um, you know, all these complex execution services and are, and are, and are trading and are sophisticated in that capacity. That's not the institutions we're focusing on. Uh, we're focusing on institutions like an LLC that wants to hold Bitcoin or, uh, or a company that use that, you know, has Bitcoin holdings and uses it to pay people. Um, uh, there's a, there's a whole nother crop of institutions that doesn't need complex, um, they, that doesn't need complex um, trading services. Uh, mm-hmm. we're, we're focused on the institutions that want more Bitcoin banking services, which, of which there are a significantly growing number, and we're getting a significant amount of inbound for those types of services. Our goal with our institutional product is to be the, pro- the institutional product accountants love and operators love because of the tooling that we provide. You know, uh, if, if we don't have a, a beautiful GUI to be able to place complex sorts of you know, TWAP orders. Like mm-hmm. that's not what we're going for, right? We're going for the, we're going for the, uh, the, the product that an accountant s- saves the accountant a hundred hours a year and makes the COO of a company just like, Oh yeah, well, we'll put our Bitcoin there and we'll be able to have all the reporting, all the a- access control we need to do. And we're willing to pay, you know, a little higher, you know, we're not going to get as good of an execution price potentially we're, cause we're, we're going to be, we're more premium. We, we're going to charge more than um, these, these, trading firms that are built for people who are, you know, flipping, flipping coins all day. And so that, that, that's kind of the take we're going there. But then the the other question here about whether, about the multi-asset support, um, you know, I, we haven't seen any of that yet. No one's so far, no one's asked us, do we support X, Y, or Z, uh, coin? Um, and I think that I truly do think that it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy by focusing on only Bitcoin, um, we can build tooling that no one else can build because they're, they're focused across the spectrum and across all these different cryptocurrencies. And the way I like to frame this is there's almost a bit of a paradox here. <clears throat> and that's if there's going to be a world of multiple cryptocurrencies and crypto assets, then they have to be differentiated in some capacity at the protocol level. And mm-hmm. if they're differentiated in some capacity at the protocol level, then the products built for those need to expose those protocol level un- um, unique things. And so far, none of, the, none of the products that have gone broad across different crypto assets have been capable of doing any of that, with the exception of a little bit of staking stuff here and there. So what we're seeing is that, um, you know, 
no one's really just picked one asset. And, and to us, it makes sense to pick the one asset that everyone wants and is by far the most popular and really truly build a financial institution around that and try and do one thing really well. No one's tried to do that yet. And, and that's the approach we're taking. We're not, you know, if we tried to go broad across a bunch of different assets, I mean, we'd just be like everyone else, you know, and, and um, we wouldn't really be not need, be needed. We're trying to build something different. And, and you guys uh, close around in, in Q4, correct? Uh, we raised the seed round last year. We'll be announcing the details of that um, in a little bit. Okay. Well, I won't scoop you on this podcast. I'll, I'll show a little bit of mercy here. So you, I don't, I don't <laughs> ruin your marketing calendar. Um, what, uh, what, if anything about your approach changed the type of target investors you were approaching? Was it kind of traditional crypto investors? Was it uh, more um, legacy venture capital firms? H how did you think about building a network that was going to buy into this single asset focus which you know really does cut across the uh, uh, go against the grain right now. Yeah, so you know to be honest, we don't view ourselves as a crypto company. I think that's like mm -hmm. the big thing here. We're we view ourselves as a financial institution that's legitimizing Bitcoin as money. And so mm -hmm. because of that, we don't you know um, our focus isn't on winning over uh, like crypto investors or, or people who are necessarily um, have been in the space for a long time. Uh, now, winning over the Bitcoin people has been one of our focuses um, because we, I do truly think that by building a product for those people who like really love Bitcoin, um, is it, it one, um, there's no product out there yet that really kind of checks all the boxes. And so I think we've built that with our, our Lightning Network support, our really good on-chain functionality. Um, but also there's just been no product that also checks all the boxes for people who are totally outside of this world and expect this you know, proper, normal financial tooling. Basically, our approach here is the, the financial in industry has gotten a lot of things right over the years and in mm -hmm. the, the products that they've built and put out. And we won't, we're trying to take as much of that as possible. And so um, in terms of people we, we we're partnering with, uh, but, you know, both investors and, and consumers and just people we talk to, a lot of those people are just from the traditional financial world who are starting to get interested in this. Um, we have a lot of conversations with registered investment advisors, um, mm -hmm. you know, wealthy folks across the country and, and all states, um, the Midwest, Texas, Florida, um, all over the place. And there is so far very few of these conversations. Um, you know, anyone's asked us about alternative assets uh, out, outside of Bitcoin. Let's, let's broaden the scope of Bitcoin a bit. How have you thought about Bitcoin cash support and, and the one true Bitcoin Satoshi's vision. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, and I think that's important for two reasons. One, uh, there, there is a sizable sub communities around, um, well, let's just focus on the one that matters, Bitcoin cash. Uh, there is a sizable sub community, especially internationally around Bitcoin cash. Maybe more importantly, the precedent has been set that there could be other hard forks and other assets that you may have to support or think about support for. Um, what, is going to be the policy and, and, and thought process behind how to handle future instances of, of chain splits where, where new assets might emerge and, and that effectively makes you either multi-asset or puts you in a position where you need to find a way to distribute the proceeds of the non yeah. fork to your customers. Yeah. So um, actually Nick Carter asked me this question recently and you know, the reality is um, I think it's a bit of a fool's errand to, try to predefine the rules you're going to use for choosing a fork if there is one. Mm -hmm. And so we, we haven't done that. However, the reality of the situation is if there is a contentious hard fork and the other, and, and, and both sides have significant value and, and we have to pick one, um, you know, the most likely outcome is that we do pick one and we only support one because our thing is doing one thing and doing it well. And, and then the second one gets, you know, we give clients the option to take the distribution and, you know, give us an address to send it to them, or we just automatically cash it for the, you know, sell it and credit their, um, their account for the, the fork side that we do support. So that's, that's the game plan. I don't see a contentious hard fork come. There, there's nothing on the horizon that I see causing something like this. Um, um, you know, maybe, maybe down the road, um, 
but you know, it, nothing, nothing in the near term that I'm too concerned about. Well, time, time will tell, but some of the privacy upgrades that might hit the Bitcoin blockchain could become contentious just from a compliance standpoint. Um, if you want to continue to support these assets or many of the major exchanges want to be in a position to support these assets. Um, that's maybe a little bit too down the rabbit hole of, of theoretical, but, but what is your uh, position on, on Bitcoin privacy and, and how to navigate that particular element? Um, just from a, a KYC AML standpoint and, and some of the guidance is coming out of FATF and, and the group of entities that are trying to triangulate around what a crypto solution to the travel rule could be. Yeah. So, there's, I mean, there's two aspects to this. One is the protocol level um, kind of privacy technologies that, that, that can be built. And the other is how companies like ours interface with regulators and uh, how the conversation around this moves forward. I do think that it's, it's our responsibility as institutions to help steer the narrative here and to help educate regulators on this issue and to do as much as possible to protect the privacy of our clients. Um, I think that it's still too early to know exactly how this is going to play out. I don't have the answers. Um, mm -hmm. My goal is to have conversations with the regulators, have conversations in DC and try to explain to the regulators, um, you know, how one, how this technology works Two, how, I mean, we're already, we already KYC our users. So, um, if someone's committing a crime, uh, uh, you know, old fa good old fashioned police work and a subpoena is perfectly, um, capable of, of solving it, any crime. So I, you know, I, I think that, um, trying to turn every Bitcoin exchange into part of a surveillance dragnet is a huge mistake and isn't good for the United States in general. And that's a conversation that needs to be had. Um, I truly do think that that, that way of thinking is anti-American and, um, you know, very, you know, reminds me to something that, that the Soviet Union would have in place. And I, I, I think that that's a conversation that needs to be had. And, um, and I think we can make a lot of progress here. Now, that's not to say re regulators are, a lot of them have, do have very good intentions. And I've spent time talking to regulators and, you know, from their perspective, they, they see people all day who are stealing money, committing atrocious crimes and and need to be take uh, and need to be um and justice needs to be served and they they you know their intention is to make it as easy as possible to stop bad actors now you know the unfortunate consequence of some of these um some of the individuals who are pushing for like super super heavy um kind of surveillance type policies for for bitcoin exchanges is that you know um it, the the privacy consequences are, are quite dramatic. And a lot of these chain analysis type tools where user information is being shared and, um, and tied to Bitcoin addresses, it's just, it's kind of scary. And um, so I don't have all the answers. I hope that, you know, us as an industry can work with regulators to move this conversation forward in, in a productive way. Um, so, so yeah, I, I don't know. We'll have to see how this plays out. There's one other uh, component that uh, that I wanted to talk about, just switching gears a bit. I, I think uh, we could talk about the theoretical and, and philosophical from a, a, a legal, political standpoint all we want. Uh, and and uh, I'm sure it would make for an entertaining sidebar. Uh, but I, uh, I think you know, most people might be interested in the real nuts and bolts of, um, of some of the different features that you're building. And, and the one that stands out to me as unique is your early support, given everything else that you're doing from a feature set standpoint. The, the one that stands out that is very different from any other you know, prime broker service or, or um, banking-like, you know, trading-like focused entity is the Lightning support that you have. What would have been some of the key learnings early on and, and where do you ultimately think Lightning is gonna play a, a role long-term in your product aside from what it seems like right now might just be kind of experimental um, integration. Yeah. So the way we view lightning support is just one more rail to move your Bitcoin on and off in and out of your account with us. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I'm about to put out a blog post you know, called the state of river in 2020, uh, you know, kind of over the last year 
Uh, so far, we've seen about 9% of our clients use the Lightning Network. Mm -hmm. um, so it definitely is still sort of beta. And we do have limits on the amounts you can deposit and withdraw because of, you know, obviously the natural um, issues that are yet to be solved around just handling capacity, also just giving us the ability to learn uh, and manage a service like this. It's There aren't many Lightning services that um, are multi-user and are, are moving large amounts of money. And it's just something we need to learn and, and grow up with. And mm -hmm. so um, we have seen quite, quite, solid success in, in, in payments and um, our clients have been overall quite happy. We do see some failures here and there. Um, some of it's routing and, and liquidity constraints, but some of it is just little quirks with other types of nodes and wallets. And um, so things like that still definitely need to be worked out. But overall, I've been very happy with, with how this has evolved. Our Bitcoin infrastructure in general, um, we built out from scratch. Um, our, for our Lightning node, we use LND, but we built out our own Bitcoin wallet um, obviously, it was Bitcoin Core for our consensus, um, you know, for, for our consensus and peer-to-peer -peer stuff. But uh, all of our Bitcoin infrastructure and our, and our, our web infrastructure is stored uh, on our own servers in a big 2,000-pound vault. Uh, we decided that early on that we couldn't go in the cloud and have a solid security foundation. This, the attack surface is too large in a cloud environment. Um, if we were at AWS or Google or Microsoft, Azure, there'd be, you know, potentially hundreds of people that could theoretically access our systems. And this wasn't acceptable for a company building a Bitcoin financial institution. So, uh, we, but we've been very happy with how everything has worked out. Um, so, and because we're Bitcoin focused, we can do all this very focused, um, you know, uh, build these focused services around things like the Lightning Network, special wallet features. One thing that we're in the process of working on is giving clients the ability to set up um, an account by registering a hardware wallet so that instead of withdrawing to a specific address, they can just withdraw to their hardware wallet in the UI and even set up an automated recurring purchase that auto withdraws to that hardware wallet. Um, all of those things are things we can do because we have this custom Bitcoin infrastructure and we can um, create you know, arbitrary wallet types and have multiple wallets for multiple users uh, going forward. Theoretically, we could do things where uh, we could have a vault type of account where we have a segregated wallet for each individual user. We can see all of your UTXOs when you deposit them. We can send you, you know, theoretically, you know, a, a, a signed uh, or dummy um, PSBT that proves that we have ownership of those UTXOs you deposited, which serves as effectively a proof of reserves. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's all sorts of cool things we can do because of this. Awesome. Uh, well, Alex, I think last but not least, uh, would love to hear your prognostication uh, and, and, and maybe a, a, a firsthand account of what, if any, changes in sentiment or customer interest you're seeing related to the happening. There, I think this is maybe one of the most overblown um, narrative schisms that's, that's you know, taking place in, in you know, the broader crypto community right now. Is the having already priced in because there's a ton of people that are emerging market hypothesis, you know, uh, you know, bulls and proponents and, and a lot of ink has been spilled on the subject or are we in a position where the narrative alone is driving more interest from both an individual high net worth, but also institutional standpoint where ha have you seen any signal amidst all the noise given the service you're running? So I, I will say, I don't know. And I won't, I, I don't ever pretend to know with these things. And anecdotally, though, um, it might be interesting to know that I haven't heard one person who's not kind of in deep in the Bitcoin world already ask me about the halving. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't think that kind of everyday, um, you know, individuals, especially like high net worth individuals who are starting to think about Bitcoin are, I don't think they're actively thinking about this halving coming mm up. Um, so that's not, a, that's not something I've, I think is top of mind for many people that I've spoken with. I'm not sure what the implication there, um, but uh, you know, I, I've I've had only the only people very deep in Bitcoin already have brought that up at, at all. Interesting. Um, well, uh, in terms of what people should look forward to for new features this year, new rollouts, what um, what does the roadmap look like for 2020, and what are you most excited about? 
Yeah, so I'm most excited uh, right now about our effort to split out our user interface into this multi-account, multi-user um, structure where an individual can have multiple accounts under one login and add different users of various levels like accounting, uh, like, a, like their accountant or financial advisor or spouse and mm -hmm. create all these different account types. And, I, and I'm very excited about all these different account types that we're building out. So like I mentioned, um, uh, kind of transactional accounts, like saving, um, non-custodial where you're registering your Harbor wallet with us, but we still watch your coins for you. Um, and, uh, tax advantaged accounts and on the consumer side, that's the stuff I'm most excited about on the institutional side, building this product that, um, operators and accountants at companies that hold Bitcoin love is, uh, I think uh, going to be a really big deal. Beautiful looking site and service. Uh, and uh, thank you. Certainly a novel looking approach. I, I, I can't imagine what you must have spent for river.com either. Um, <laughs> Wasn't so, cheap. <laughs> I'm sure uh, five letter, uh, you know, pretty, pretty prominent brand name. Uh, can't be, can't possibly be cheap, but it, I think it speaks to the, the brand that you're trying to build. And so far uh, by, by all appearances, it, it seems to be working. So uh, good luck for the rest of this year. I, I hope things, go swimmingly well, because if they go well for you guys, it probably means it's going to be going well for me as a personal Bitcoin bag holder. Um, probably. But, uh, but in the meantime, uh, where can people reach out, find out more uh, about the company and, uh, and, and you personally, if they want to follow you on Twitter? Totally. So um, river.com is the domain. You can request an invitation there for a consumer or reach out to us if you're an institution. We have a page for that there as well. Um, if you want to reach out to me directly, uh, my email is alex at river.com, or you can follow me on Twitter at Leishman, my last name, L-E-I-S-H-M-A-N. So yeah, I'm very, um, I'm easy to reach and try to be pretty responsive. So feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Alex, thanks again for joining for this episode. And thank you, everyone that's watching, listening, half listening. Hopefully it was an entertaining episode. We got much more to come, uh, but for today, uh, Alex Leishman from River Financial, uh, an exciting new Bitcoin financial services company. So thanks again. And until next time, peace.